Uh, welcome to this second day of the Arctic Guardians Dialogue, which is organized by the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network, and the University of Akureyri. My name is Embla Eirotsdottir, and I'm director of the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network, and I will be your moderator for today. Uh, for your information, this webinar is being streamed on the Icelandic Coast Guard Facebook page, and it will also be recorded and shared online after the event. Uh, we have an excellent set of speakers today who will be discussing various uh, aspects of marine environmental response. Um, and the format will be as follows. Each speaker has about 20 minutes for their presentations. Um, each presentation will be followed by a, questions, uh, a few minutes of questions and answers. We encourage attendees to use the Q&A function in Zoom and start sending in their questions as they come. But without further ado, we should turn to our first speaker. Uh, Trond Hjort Larsen, who is with the Norwegian Coastal Administration, he will be uh, starting our event here today. Uh, he uh, will be discussing Norwegian oil spill response in cold waters, lessons learned from the North Guider and Gordafoss incidents. Trond, you're welcome. Thank you. I'll start with uh, sharing my screen. And I hope you all see uh, the presentation now. Yeah. Okay, I will uh, speak some of the lessons learned from the Nordgaider and Gulafoss uh, incident. In short, the Nordgaider incident will focus on the uh, emergency offloading of uh, a lot of diesel from uh, a grounded trawler at 80 degrees north in Hinlopen Strait. And at the end, uh, I will change to the Gudafoss incident, which will focus on collecting heavy oil at sea with booms and skimmers in temperatures down to minus 20. A few words about the uh, NCA. We are a Ministry of Transport and Communication, uh, together with my department for Environment and Emergency Response. There is also the Department for Navigation Technology, uh, under the Department for Transport, Port and Fairways. Key information, approximately 1,000 employees, a large budget, main office, Olesen, um, available resources 24-7 is among them, 15 depots with oil spill equipment, six NCA multi-vessels, 11 Coast Guard vessels with oil spill equipment. We also run a pilot service, um, we have aircraft, four vessel traffic centers, and an, an emergency response six-man duty team 24-7. The incident with the fishing vessel North Guider. The distance from uh, Longyearbyen uh, on Spitsbergen to Hinlopen Strait uh, is almost 200 nautical miles. That is a sailing distance of 24 hours one way. There is no other settlement in the area than Longyearbyen and a small research settlement here in, uh, in the New Olesund. When uh, we took the journey first time, uh, the entire polar cap uh, which we see here in red, uh, was uh, pushing southwards due to heavy northerly winds with a speed of 10 nautical miles uh, a day. The green area here is supposed to be very open drift ice, uh, but actually was two-year-old ice with up to two meters of thickness. And this was on the first days of January that we had to pass through this. So we were, we were a bit worried about this ice shelf coming in from the north. There were also ice on the south part. From our perspective, this was an incident that happened really far, far away. It would be dark and cold. Um, there were no moon at that time being, uh, and it was uh, cloudy almost all the time. So it was really dark. 
the temperature ranged between 12 and 25 and below zero. There would be ice in the waters and it would be more coming. So any operation would need ice class vessel and experienced crew. We therefore asked the Norwegian Armed Forces Headquarters to mobilize Coast Guard vessel Svalbard. This is the only vessel with ice breaking capacities in Norway, but it only had a small amount of oil recovery equipment uh, and the capacities aboard. No dedicated oil recovery tanks, for instance. Time was also a critical factor, especially due to the ice. We knew that these waters usually would be fully ice covered in February, March until June, July. And how would the ice impact on the vessel during the winter? Break her up completely? This was what we arrived to uh, in the early days of January. A trawler 55 meters long, listing 17 degrees to starboard. More than 330,000 liters of diesel aboard, obviously grounded, but what else? Leaking oil, damages, possible to salvage, possible to enter. Would it be dangerous? What can be done and what should be done? The uh, first inspection uh, in these two first days uh, indicated that, that uh, the vessel was not possible to bring, bring afloat. Luckily, she was not leaking externally um, and she was laying stable towards uh, an underwater rock. So the decision was made uh, to empty her as, as much oil and lubricants uh, as possible together with uh, trawls, fishing gear, any bits and pieces that we could possibly bring along from the vessel. And we should use Coast Guard vessel Svalbard as a platform for this. Already during the first days uh, here, we started the removal of, of bits and pieces, um, but the emergency offloading uh, had to wait. We needed more uh, equipment uh, and more men to do so. So we had to go back to Longyearbyen to mobilize this. Some pictures from the early stages, the first inspection. Uh, you see the picture up to the right. Uh, this is the overflooded engine room, which is uh, completely filled with seawater. There is a top layer there of about one inch uh, of uh, oil. Um, and also the generator room was, uh, was overflowed, so there was no uh, power aboard. So we had to establish light, power, uh, and a heating compartment. And we started to enter the ship for nets, trolls, bits and pieces. Uh, we also brought along a 20 feet container, which we filled up at least two times during the entire operation. We went down to Longyearbyen, mobilized, made plans, uh, and then uh, returned back to North Guider on uh, a few days later. We had to wait uh, a bit for the weather to calm down, but then we started. And the plan in simple uh, is as described here on the right side. You should establish pumping station aboard North Guider and Coast Guard vessel Svalbard. Polar circle boats should go in shuttle with two IBCs, uh, a thousand liter each on each turn, as you can see here on the picture uh, to the left. There were altogether 13 different tanks that planned to be entered and emptied aboard North Guider through manhole openings. And all diesel uh, was supposed to be delivered to, to Coast Guard vessel Svalbard regular fuel tanks. Luckily, they had spare capacity and the diesel was not polluted. Picture up left shows uh, the hydraulic power pack that we used on board North Guider. This was um, operated by, by a, a guy who turned it from bypass to idle whenever needed. Um, the pump we used aboard North Guider was this Karm pump, uh, most often used to, to empty boats for seawater or, or other water, but we adapted it a bit so it could take oil. To the right here, you see uh, uh, the hoses that we used on the on the pump station at Coast Guard vessel Svalbard. Um, we improvised a bit on that one and made a straw uh, in which we could reach to the bottom of the IBCs. 
and we also had a valve here, so it could uh, uh, lock it when we were finished with the, with the pumping. In that case, we always made sure that this hose here uh, were filled with diesel uh, and that we didn't um, suck in too much air so that the pumps would cavitate. Down left, you see the uh, hydraulic power pack used aboard um, Coast Guard vessel Svalbard. This is an old fashioned one, uh, but I really trust in that um, compared to, compared to an, uh, some of the new ones that we have. So, uh, so we use that one. And in the middle down here, you see the pump that we used uh, to suck all the IBCs uh, empty. It's a Fogelsang pump um, and it uh, sucked uh, from a lifting height for four to five meters, and that functioned really well. Down right, you see uh, the guys uh, operating the maneuver panel uh, for the pump uh, aboard, aboard uh, Svalbard. Uh, and they were standing in shelter in the port side uh, boat dock, so they were having quite good conditions. The uh, Polo Circle boats came along. Uh, Coast Guard vessel Svalbard, uh, moored up uh, on this rope here, uh, put the engine uh, in re reverse, and then the hose was lowered down with this straw here, and we started to pump or to suck, suck, suck them dry. And the average uh, speed of that was about 90 seconds per container. So we used approximately five minutes each turn to, to empty uh, these two containers from, from the boats. The yellow boat here is the mob boat for Coast Guard vessel Svalbard. Uh, and we use that to change the crews uh, that were always working at North Guider. Uh, they were bringing all the equipment bits and pieces from, from North Guider back to Coast Guard vessel Svalbard. And they were lifted up and down uh, on the starboard boat dock uh, at least 200 times, I believe. Uh, but that is a routine operation uh, for, for the Coast Guard in Norway. So uh, it was done in a very secure way. Some pictures from uh, North Guider. You see here the bottom tanks, uh, uh, which were emptied, port side and starboard side. After they were emptied of diesel, we re refilled these bottom tanks with seawater in order to make it stable. And to the right here, you see uh, a high tank, number two uh, port side. So they gently released um, uh, the opening here, uh, let the diesel go into this uh, room here, and then just sucked it up. And furthermore, uh, they lowered the pump into these manholes openings. Uh, and finally, they actually went down into the tanks with uh, oxygen masks to, to take uh, the very rest uh, of it. I also took this picture with us because um, the ability to repair uh, was crucial on this uh, mission. To have enough spare parts and, and uh, to have the people who can repair things that get broken during uh, this operation was vital. So that was uh, really important. Um, down left, you can see the peristaltic pump that we also used to, to empty the lube oil and uh, hydraulic oil. Uh, and uh, they actually went up to the rail here uh, on the starboard side and then down the vents. Uh, and they had a suction height of more than seven meters. So the pumping rate was slow. That's why we needed the temporary storage containers here and then another pump to deliver all over to the polar circle boats. This oil were contaminated with seawater, so we could not store it outdoor, nor take it onto the tanks of Coast Guard vessel Svalbard. Um, so we had to take them into the warm so that you shouldn't uh, freeze up and then uh, collapse uh, due to that. We also spent some days uh, at the very end taking care of uh, the double trawl uh, because it was there actually catching birds in the net uh, and we didn't want that to, to happen. Down right, you see some of the bits and pieces that we took with us also on this second tour. Lessons learned. I believe that the component, complex and wide range skills and know-how 
on the crew that took part in this operation was uh, a success criteria. Many of them had long experience of living and working in the harsh conditions in the Arctic, and this counted for both the crew aboard Coast Guard vessel Svalbard and many of the external ones who were tasked for this mission. Among them, uh, the local recruited men from, from our strike team in Longyearbyen. Also, the leadership and the organization of the operation was uh, extraordinary. Um, it doesn't help if you have very well qualified men with you, if you don't have the leadership to get all these qualities uh, into the light. Um, also, we made some experience to the personal protecting equipment. Um, among them, the use of overshoes, headlamps, alpine goggles, neoprene face masks, heat pads for gloves and work shoes, survival suits, spikes for shoes. It was slippery on the deck of the trawler and uh, radios for everyone. So they were updated on what happened. For the equipment, um, transitions in several dim dimensions were important. Uh, the knowledge in how to use all the equipment that we had uh, was vital. We needed lightweight equipment. It, sh it must be um, portable and we needed light, both external and personal. All this equipment we need uh, close at hand. Uh, that means in long uh, and on relevant vessels operating in the area. The distance are so far from the mainland Norway up there that we, we can't wait for, for equipment to be transported to, to the area. I think this picture illustrates um, the importance of, of having um, lightweight equipment because all equipment um, had to be taken through this door on the uh, starboard side of on the trawler. This picture is taken in June 2019 uh, and the trawler was removed in bits and pieces by Smith Salvage in September 2020. Okay, uh, four minutes I see then on the Godafoss. Uh, this was uh, in 2011 in the winter in the southern parts of Norway. Uh, approximately 120 cubic uh, leaked out immediately and of that almost 50% were collected uh, at sea. The ice uh, mixed uh, together with the oil uh, and it uh, made it challenge to us. The use of radars uh, gave us the possibility to also operate at night. You see here the dark part is the dampening of the waves, so that is oil. And here the white stripe to the left uh, is the mixture of ice and oil. You also need infrared cameras to uh, measure the thickness of the oil. And we today have the Securus infrared and daylight camera on all NCA multi-vessels and several Coast Guard vessels. And in oil spill business, um, height is everything. So today, the use of remote pilot assisted systems with daylight and infrared cameras is a good help uh, for us. AIS boys, um, Coast Guard vessel Harsta in this case, were engaging one oil slick in this area, got reports of another one here, further south, just put an AIS boy into that. And um, uh, when they finished the first one, they uh, could easily engage the second one with a position up there. So the Coast Guard, um, we're using Lamour sweep arms and grab, and if it became too much ice, uh, then the, um, it just backed off a little and set another course. It was enough oil, he said, the captain. Here we are concentrating the oil, uh, leading to another sweep arm system. Conventional boom of Coast Guard vessel Harsta. Teared and weared by the ice, uh, and we can see that grab was used in many of these cases. Also, the brush belt skimmer uh, was good, together with the heating capacity to melt away ice. Another picture of grab 
it was a sticky business. I just have two, two more slides now. Uh, see, there are some comments here. Yeah, um, two more slides. Uh, we saw this on, uh, uh, we looked to Finland also to see uh, uh, on their Lamour bucket skimmer, which is a uh, uh, brush skimmer together with a grab. Um, we have winterized the traditional uh, foxtail to an Arctic foxtail with built-in internal heating. And we have uh, bought in uh, these very solid booms to be used in ice infested waters. There are some links to, to further information uh, at the end of my brief. I'll send it to, to Thomas and you can go into them and see some videos and some. And uh, I have now used 19 minutes uh, according to, to the counter on my presentation. So, but that's it. Thank you for your attention. Now we can open for questions and, and answers. Thank you very much, Trond, for a for a for a very um, graphic presentation and interesting. Um, and it seems like a good example of how even with receding sea ice, we are far from being in clear waters, and how uh, there are many different factors at play that need to be considered in this area. Um, I would like to uh, invite the audience to send in their questions into Q and A. But while we're waiting for their responses, um, maybe I could uh, shoot at you one question. Um, so of course, uh, technology equipment knowledge and training are vital components in events such as these that you described. But you also mentioned luck in your presentation. And this is not the first time I have heard a referral to luck when it comes to incidents at sea. How big a part does luck really play in terms of conditions and available or reachable resources when it comes to successful search and rescue operations. What do you think? Uh, well, when it comes to search and rescue, I, I'm not the right one to, to answer to that. Or rescue operations such as, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, well, uh, in the case of the uh, North Guider incident, uh, we had luck with the weather, especially with the weather. Uh, we had a hurricane actually uh, passing by us one day and during the midst of the operation, but uh, we had pretty good uh, weather forecast and uh, so we were able to to to, to um, bring all the people back to Coast Guard vessel Svalbard before the, the hurricane uh, hit us. Uh, but um, if the weather had been worse, if there had been normal ice conditions in the waters, then, then this operation would have been taking much longer time and maybe not uh, been able to, to conduct uh, any, in any, any matter. So, so um, in this particular case, we were quite lucky. I would like, I would like to say something else because um, I've now spent most of my presentation on the emergency offloading uh, on on uh, North Gaida. And the point is that you will very seldom have a total collapse uh, when a vessel is grounding. And that total collapse in meaning that all tanks will uh, will uh, be destroyed and all um, fuel will, will leak out. There will always be tanks uh, intact on the vessel and, and um, Maybe also the vessel is intact itself, uh, but you need to, to light her, uh, to make her lighten, to, to, to be able to, to salvage her. Mm -hmm. and that's why the uh, uh, capability to, to do an emergency offloading uh, is important because that will very often be, be used. Maybe not 100%, but at least some of the tanks uh, will, will be emptied. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the questions are just pouring in now, so I'm going to start with questions from the audience. Um, mm. First one, um, how could the oil from the North Guider be pumped despite the harsh cold temperature? Did you use heating devices? Um, when it comes to diesel, uh, the, you know, 
the tanks uh, for the diesel was basically underwater, so they kept uh, the temperature over the water uh, surrounding the ship. And diesel is not uh, causing very high viscosity, even though if the temperatures are, are dropping. Of course, we had uh, some some um, situations of of um, filters in our own generators and pumps uh, who were clogged uh, by diesel freezing up. Uh, but we we um, uh, adapted to that by using some paraffin or or heli fuel into the diesel. Uh, when it came to the um, hydro hydraulic oil and oil and the engine oil. Uh, that was beginning to, to be quite high viscosity on that. And that is why we use the um, peristaltic pump uh, that I showed you on the picture, because that can take pretty high viscosity uh, oil, uh, also at very low suction rates. But um, we couldn't have been waiting many more days before it would have been really, really difficult to take out the engine oil and, and the hydraulic oil. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Uh, were there any difficulties in organizing the North Guider incident response between the Coast Guard and the civilian contractors? Uh, not in this case. Um, the management of the boat was a Norwegian company uh, and they were really, um, they were really, really helpful uh, and trying to do all the best that they could. Uh, and trying to, to cooperate uh, with, uh, with us and, and all the other people involved. Uh, and actually, uh, this was not a governmental um, uh, incident. It was actually a, a private organized incident using the Coast Guard as a platform for it. Because there were um, a salvage team also on board. Uh, there were two people from, from the Dutch company Ardent, uh, who were uh, kind of experts uh, to, to when it comes to salvage on, on, on the boat. Um, in this special case, uh, all forces, all different organizations worked really well together uh, in, in trying to solve this case. Um, if it had been a foreign management to this boat, then I'm not sure that it would have been the same. Um, so, and in that case, we might have had to declare a governmental uh, incident, uh, but, but in this case, it, it was not. It was really good uh, cooperation. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, how about timing between search and rescue and oil spill response? Must the search and rescue be over before you start the oil spill response? That is something that we have the exercises uh, annually uh, together with the uh, Joint Rescue Center in, in Northern Norway. Um, we have a combined search and rescue and oil spill exercise in, um, in the Varanger Fjord together with the Russians actually. And that is trained uh, annually. Uh, and it's 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 a difficult uh, question actually because uh, you don't want to take out resources that could play a vital role in the search and rescue. On the other hand, um, history tells us that uh, you can use some of the assets available uh, to to start at least preparations for the oil spill business. So um, uh, you. When we have exercises on this, uh, we try to have this, we call it gliding phases, so that you you start with search and rescue. That is the most important part. Um, but then when you get control of the resources, uh, then you try to look into, uh, okay, what are the most important resources that we still need for the search and rescue? And is it um, fair? to use some of these resources now uh, on oil spill combatment, because the resources are very often the same. Excellent, thank you very much, Trond. Thank you very much for answering these questions. Um, I think what we will do now is move on to David Yard, um, who is superintendent with the Canadian Coast Guard. Uh, and uh, David will be uh, discussing, introducing to us uh, the Canadian Coast Guard Arctic region and the 
Coast Guard to respond to two cold water incidents. Um, David, you have the floor. Thank you, Emma. I'm just going to share my screen uh, right now. There, I think you can see it now. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the purpose of my presentation today is to give you a very short introduction to uh, the new Canadian Coast Guard Arctic region, and as well to quickly talk about two very different uh, cold water Coast Guard response operations. First of all, uh, I'd like to introduce our new Coast Guard Arctic region. In 2018, uh, we had the creation of a new Fisheries and Oceans Canada and Canadian Coast Guard Arctic region to advance reconciliation and pursue a renewed relationship with Indigenous peoples. Uh, engagements with the Inuit, First Nations and Métis governments and organizations, provinces and territories, industry and Northerners and staff. Uh, the Arctic region boundaries were developed in partnership with our Arctic partners and announced in March, 2021. I have a map on the next slide. Uh, we also worked towards the creation of Inuit Community Engagement Coordinator positions, Inuit uh, Coordinator for Arctic uh, Youth Council, and a coordinator for Northern Human Resources uh, Strategy. On this slide, there's a little bit of a, a map to show you where our Arctic region resides in Canada. Um, we had the four Canadian Coast Guard Arctic regions on, on the screen right now. Uh, you can see the Western region, uh, the Arctic region, uh, central region, and Atlantic region uh, on the east coast. The DFO uh, uh, Arctic region and the Canadian Coast Guard Arctic regions share the same boundaries. Um, and uh, as well, a short note on the priorities. Um, the priorities uh, right now for our current uh, Coast Guard Arctic region are to improve operational readiness and marine safety in the Arctic uh, through continued discussions with partners on program service enhancements in the Arctic. And we have a number of priorities established right now, uh, including a governance framework and developing solutions to address specific priorities raised, which were increased capacity and service delivery, uh, include Indigenous knowledge and decision making, policy making needs to be led uh, from the North by Northerners. Uh, we want to remove employment barriers and create job opportunities in the North, uh, address climate change adaptation strategies, and infrastructure development, as well as continuing recruiting Inuit First Nations and Métis Coast Guard members into leadership, business, and operational positions. So that was the introduction of our new uh, Canadian Coast Guard Arctic region. I'm now going to move on to two very different uh, oil spill incidents that the Canadian Coast Guard responded to in cold water. The first one being the Manola Cell incident in Notre Dame Bay, Newfoundland. Uh, this incident occurred in January 1985 when a vessel outbound with a load of newsprint uh, collided with blowhard rock in Notre Dame Bay. Uh, it remained impaled on the rock for a short period of time, then eventually sank in 70 meters of water. The ship remained dormant for a number of years. Uh, eventually, in 2014, 2013, uh, it started to cause problems with leaks. And uh, the Canadian Coast Guard completed an assessment on the vessel in 2016 and concluded that approximately 150 cubic meters of oil remained in basically 14 tanks uh, on the vessel. Challenges, there was a significant number of challenges with dealing with this vessel. We had a water depth of 70 meters. We had a water temperature near one degree Celsius. The bulk of the fuel oil remaining on the ship was Bunker C, which is a persistent oil and it has to be heated to, to be able to move it. The vessel was located in an area where large frequent icebergs uh, transit virtually next door, right up until the end of June some years. It was five nautical miles from shore. The wreck itself was next or adjacent to the blowhard rock, which made maneuvering the salvage vessel uh, difficult. And the weather window for their operation uh, start to finish was only eight weeks 
out of a full year that we could do this operation in this area. And obviously it was a sensitive area with marine mammals, migratory birds, fishing and tourism activities. So it was a complex operation. So we, in our, in our plans to how we best address this, we started planning phase in early 2018. Uh, we're all familiar with the incident command system, but in this case, we use it to plan the project before we even started the project. We established a full planning team consisting of all ICS general command staff positions, and it was led by the superintendent of the ER as basically the IC in that role. In result, after a number of months planning, we had the Manolas operational plan. So before we got on site, as you can see on this screen, we had a whole series of plans prepared to start the operation, everything from waste management, wildlife uh, response, marine mammal deterrent, uh, six tier level response, decon, et cetera. So in the incident command post, we had a, a, a fair representation from a, a number of uh, entities, uh, obviously the Canadian Coast Guard. Uh, our colleagues in the United States Coast Guard also participated in the ICP uh, throughout the entire operation, as well as our large uh, fleet and small fleet uh, operations on the water, and as well uh, in the fixed and rotary uh, surveillance aircraft. Other federal departments uh, were Transport Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and DFO, as well as our provincial government representatives. There was about approximately 36 people in the, um, 30 people to 36, depending on the day of the week in the uh, ICP. Asset deployment, as you can tell, were quite extensive because we had two operations going in this response really at the one time. We had the salvage offloading operation on the tidewater uh, going on to remove the oil from the vessel, but we also had a large preparedness capacity uh, in place in the event that something went wrong with that uh, operation. And uh, on the bottom of the screen, you can see that in the peak of the operation, we had 140 personnel uh, involved. Just a quick slide on some of our surveillance platforms. Surveillance is key to any type of operation to make sure we have no undetected leaks and uh, prevent any environmental damage. We use rotary uh, helicopter, fixed wing assets. Uh, we use radar sat, eye stop. And we also use a tool, the broader, broader Sigma oil detection radar on board one of our vessels to help with uh, nighttime surveillance. On this screen, you can see uh, uh, an image of the vessel inverted on the left. And on the image on the right, you can see the 14 tanks where the pollutants were located and where we had a drilling uh, to access and heat the, the product to recover it. This is a quick photograph of the, uh, the vessel, the platform, work platform on site. And the lower right screen, you can see the work deck was it was pretty busy. It was, we had a large work deck, but the uh, operations on deck had to, were challenging and uh, uh, they worked out quite well, but placement of equipment and resources was key to, uh, to that happening as well. On this slide, I uh, just quickly want to talk about uh, the, the uh, strategy and tactics used for the pumping and uh, heating. The main uh, uh, objective we had on this operation is we want to do the heating and pumping down at the wreck site versus traditionally as you would do it at the surface on the supply vessel. So we had a heating pumping skid along with our contractors obviously um, uh, built that had the heat exchanger and the positive displacement pump and that would be lowered down onto the wreck connected to two uh, hot tap valves that would be installed in the tank Steam will be injected into the heat exchanger at roughly 160 degrees Celsius. The oil will be circulated in, well, water at first will be circulated in the tank. It would eventually move from one degree Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius and become uh, uh, an oily liquid and start stripping the tank, at which point the ROV will go over and switch over the valve and send the uh, recovered oil to the surface for processing. We had temperatures recorded inwards, upwards of 43 degrees Celsius on the return line at the surface. Uh, on the left, you see the heating and pumping skid. And in my personal opinion, that was the key to success of this operation, was how well that performed on the sub, uh, subsea operation. 
on the right is a couple of pictures of the heating uh, or the umbilical cord that would feed the heating and pumping skid. And this photograph is just a collection um, manifold system where steam and condensate and return was uh, return product was recovered. And in the lower right, you can see a sampling port we had there for doing endpoint testing. On this screen, you can see some of the frack tanks. Once the uh, oil was recovered back into the uh, frack tanks, it was allowed to settle uh, through gravity first. And then secondly, it went through uh, two oily water separators for processing uh, to remove all the water from the oil. In this image here, you can see an ROV using a barnacle buster to clean the hull of the wreck prior to the installation of a hot cap. The photograph in the middle is a hot tap insulation tool connected to the actual hot tap. And the photograph on the right is the hot tap that will be drilled and bolted to the hull. And there were two of these hot taps installed with each tank. Again, just a couple more underwater shots. Here you see the on the left, the hot tap insulation tool, uh, drilling and installing the hot tap uh, to the vessel. Uh, once that was done, it was pressurized. And once it passed the pressure test, as you can see here, the manipulator uh, is from the ROVs installing the um, uh, hose from the heating and pumping skid to the hot tap valve. The photograph on the right shows the hot tap valve connected to the heating and pumping skid and the insulation tool removed. Quick photograph of the heating and pumping skid installed on the uh, rack. So endpoint testing and oil recovery. Uh, as mentioned, once we got the oil up to roughly 15 degrees Celsius, it started to strip the tank. Um, it took approximately 16 to 18 hours to heat each tank. And we really recovered pure oil at the beginning of the uh, stripping runs and pumping runs. And eventually as it uh, we got towards the end, uh, the oil content would decrease and the water content would increase. So we would stop pumping operations and we do a secondary heating and a second stripping process of the tank. We found out that two, uh, two of these cycles will clean uh, all bulk pollution out of one of the tanks. So the results or conclusion. Uh, 208.7 cubic meters of heavy fuel oil were recovered from the wreck. Uh, we had no lost time injuries, uh, no secondary pollution incidents, and we completed it within the eight week uh, operational weather window. And for the Canadian Coast Guard, it was our first direless operation to uh, heat and remove heavy fuel oil from a sunken wreck in 70 meters of cold water. The next incident I'm gonna talk about is again, very different. Uh, uh, but equally important was a spill in Postville, Labrador. So our Canadian Coast Guard Atlantic region has always had a supportive relationship with our national government. Uh, recent incidents uh, such as this particular incident has only gone to strengthen that relationship. This incident started on June 8th, uh, 2020 with a report of pollution on the water uh, near the community of Postville. Um, Coast Guard uh, immediately tasked a surveillance aircraft to validate the report and basically came back and confirmed that there was approximately 2,870 liters of oil on the surface of uh, the water uh, near Postville. So some of the first things that we did to address that uh, uh, report and, and uh, report back from the aircraft was we uh, immediately um, stood up an incident command post to support the incident. Um, we uh, immediately flew a liaison officer into the community um, at first opportunity, and then subsequently response personnel and equipment followed the next day. And the photograph on the right is the ICS org structure that uh, I had established for the response to this incident. Community engagement was key on this operation. We had daily meetings between the Coast Guard liaison officer and the Postal Community Government and in the Nazi government. Coast Guard relied on the community to provide additional information on local sensitivities, cultural areas and areas of special interest. And 
uh, as well, we opened up all helicopter surveys to all levels of government to uh, participate in those surveys with our responders to collect and uh, ensure that we had the correct information uh, on hand for response planning. Community concerns uh, in the area were, were obviously the Arctic chair fishery, seabirds, the fate and effects of the spilled oil and how it would impact uh, uh, livelihoods. Uh, the limited response capacity where the area was so remote. And obviously we had to deal with COVID-19 issues as well. From a response challenge perspective, Postville is a fly-in, fly-out community and it's 500 nautical miles roughly north northwest of St. John's. The log logistic challenges from a response perspective were basically due to its short gravel runway there was no road access and a lack of local accommodations. And again, for COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we had to uh, bring additional PPE and, and obtain permission for Coast Guard responders to enter the community for the response. So as mentioned, the fixed wing uh, surveillance aircraft did pick up a 2,870 liter uh, sheen of oil. Uh, no source was attached to it. And the uh, area coverage was roughly 3.5 nautical miles by one nautical mile. So daily shoreline uh, assessments, we call them SCAD assessments, were conducted using local knowledge, which was key to identify sensitive cultural and protected areas. Uh, we used large and small vessel assets along with uh, rotary and fixed wing aircraft to support these surveys. And in some cases, the surveys had to be conducted by teams virtually walking the coastline because of accessibility issues, et cetera. And we provided community leaders um, the opportunity to participate in all surveillance flights uh, as well. So because of the migratory bird concern, Coast Guard requested the Environment and Climate Change Canada to provide information on the sensitivities, modeling the mass balance, uh, Coast Guard conducted booming recovery operations as required. The Canadian Wildlife Service were engaged to provide information on birds in the area. And they set up a program where our Coast Guard George R. Parks vessel could go out and actually complete a bird survey of the area on behalf of CWS. Uh, in summary, the operations continued and the surveillance flights on July 5th, uh, 15 confirmed no further pollution uh, remained on the water from uh, from all the response activities previously mentioned. Conclusions, lessons learned on this one. Uh, Coast Guard established an ICS team and deployed a response team to the site, uh, supported by the Coast Guard, Coast Guard rotary aircraft and the Coast Guard George R. Perk ship. That seemed to work well. Joint surline, uh, shoreline surveys were conducted with the Nanatsuka government officials and local community members, which I think were key. Uh, in, in our intel uh, collection and uh, information gathering. Daily updates were provided to all levels of government and community members. Coast Guard was open and transparent with all levels of government. The IC provided daily updates to the national government and the mayor of Postville. The Coast Guard liaison op and operations officers participated in community radio, radio calls. And basically this allowed the Coast Guard to gain valuable information that we did not have on the area as well, it was a two-way uh, benefit. That's it, I think I have one and a half minutes left. Any questions? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, David. What perfect timing, one minute. Um, thank you for a, a, a very interesting presentation. It seems to me that surface incidents are, are complex enough Subsea operations obviously exceed those levels of complexity and the whole process seems quite impressive. Um, I would like to again invite the audience to send in their questions. But while we hold on for those, um, I have, a, I have a, a, a little comment myself and a question, if that's okay with you, David. Yes, most certainly, Elmer. Okay, so the Canadian Coast Guard Arctic region seemed to be extensively engaging with local stakeholders, including youth and indigenous uh, organizations or associations, indigenous people's associations and residents in the region. Could you maybe share with us your reflection or elaborate a little bit on the importance of this engagement process and these relationships uh, for your work? 
Uh, these these relationships and uh, engagements are, are key to the type of work that we do, whether it be search and rescue or environmental response. And if you look at the postal example there, uh, while it wasn't a huge, huge incident, it, was, it could have had the potential to cause significant damage. And our responders are well-trained and they know the operations of uh, spill uh, response, but you really need the support of the community and the local knowledge to, to prepare the proper strategies and tactics uh, to put a proper plan in place to, to mitigate the uh, pollution damage. And uh, our communities and, and uh, the various governments are, and right down to the, uh, uh, the community members are a key, key part of that. So it, it's, it's invaluable and I can't stress enough the importance to, to have those relationships. Not only during an incident, and we try to work quite hard from a training perspective uh, as well when we have training opportunities to, to provide training on the air and environmental response. Uh, we have a number of programs. So we, we, we try to, to keep those engagements open well in advance of any incident. But when an incident does happen, it certainly helps as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Um, we now have a question from the audience. Regarding the Manolis L, uh, was the heating device specifically built for the pumping operation, or is there any standardized technology for such operation in very cold waters? Uh, to answer the first part of that question, that heating and pumping skid, which I consider the star of the operation, in, in my opinion, because I was on the ship and used it every day, uh, that was built specifically for this operation. Traditionally, um, I guess in a lot of situations like this, uh, heating and pumping was always done on the surface with, on the supply ship. We wanted to go subsurface to prevent, uh, to minimize uh, the heat loss, first of all, but also to, to, uh, to reduce the risk of secondary pollution incidents because when we were circulating in the closed, closed loop system to heat the product in the tank on the vessel, the lines from the heating and pumping skid to the hot tap valve connections on the tank were only approximately 20 feet long. So the risk of having one of those break in a major pollution incident was a lot less than running the fluid 200 uh, feet to the surface through four inch lines. So that was part of the operation. And as well, this was the first diverless operation where we use ROVs strictly no divers at all to do this operation so the heating and pumping skid had to be built so that the rov could manipulate the controls on the skid to send oil to the surface when it got to the correct temperature okay excellent um another question uh again regarding the manolis uh, were some procedures produced and spread within the canadian coast guards were some procedures established alongside the U.S. Coast Guards? Yeah, yeah. Well, what in this case, uh, in Atlantic Canada, we have the Can You Slant uh, Joint an uh, Annex. So we do joint plans with our colleagues in the U.S. Coast Guard, and we exercise and train our responders. Uh, so what we also do is when there's opportunities to uh, to uh, learn from each other's uh, incidents, we we. Uh, we open the opportunity up for responders to uh, from, from both the US Coast Guard and the Canadian Coast Guard to participate in uh, in those operations and uh, it, uh, it it worked quite it works quite well to transfer information and, and knowledge and, and uh, promote uh, uh, response capacity in both organizations mm -hmm. um, so I have a question. So you being an expert in the field, I want to solicit your opinion on something. And this is maybe a, a sort of a broader question um, for the Arctic region in general. Um, but with the prediction of increased shipping traffic um, or traffic of vessels in the Arctic region in general, including along the coast of Canada, how much of a concern would this be to the Canadian Coast Guard? I mean, what, what do you do? You, uh, would you assess that Coast Guard cap capacity in general in the Arctic uh, region is sufficient for uh, significantly increased traffic of vessels? Well, the priorities for the Canadian Coast Guard are obviously the safety of life at sea and protection of the marine environment. And uh, we take that very serious and ensure there's adequate resources to cover the risk in, in waters under Canadian jurisdiction. Um, 
And as in anywhere in the world, as traffic increases, so does the risk assessments have to increase, so does the preparedness level and capacity have to increase. So it's uh, it's just part of the dynamic that we uh, we deal with every day, and we take risk very seriously, and we monitor it uh, sometimes on a daily basis and annually basis to ensure that we have the right preparedness capacity, not just for ER, but for search, search and rescue and uh, and the whole uh, fleet of uh, sweep of uh, Coast Guard programs right down to ice breaking, et cetera, and nav aids, uh, boy tending, MCTS. It all, it's all part of the uh, overall plan and package. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, David. You've been very clear in your presentation and your answers. Um, we don't have any other questions at the moment, but uh, if the audience wants to send in questions, you can do that and we will get them to David and he will maybe try to answer your questions. Uh, I believe we're now heading into a few minutes break. So I suggest we go into that uh, three minutes before it's supposed to start. Uh, we will reconvene at 14.15 uh, GMT time. Uh, so thank hey, thanks, Emily. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Well, hello again, everyone, and welcome back. I hope you've had a relaxing uh, break. We will dive right into it uh, with Tom Buddy. Tom is the executive secretary of uh, CAF, which is uh, Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, a working group of the Arctic Council. Uh, with him will be Susse Wegerberg, uh, who is senior advisor and representative of the Kingdom of Denmark in the CMPP uh, uh, CAF, which is a circumpolar monitoring biodiversity program, uh, also with CAF. Uh, Tom and Susse, are you ready? Hi, uh... Hi, Embla. Sorry, yes. my camera has seemed to have broken, but so you can hear me anyway, which is all that matters. <laughs> I can hear and, you. Yeah, my, my, my computer seems to be freezing as well. But Susan is going to uh, share the uh, presentation that we have. Yeah. And I'm speaking to a blank screen, so I'll assume that it's up on the screen <laughs> as, it, as it is now. Yes, so, please let me know if you can all see it. We can see it. We can see it fine. Super. And we can see you now, Tom. So this is okay. Fantastic. Then, then that makes everything perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so good, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my, my name is Tom, and uh, myself and my colleague Suze are going to speak a little bit uh, from a different perspective from those presentations that have been uh, held so far today. Uh, we're going to speak from the perspective of the Arctic Council, uh, specifically from the work that it does on biodiversity and some of its activities that might be of relevance for our discussions here today. And <coughs> excuse me, and uh, and also look at uh, oil spill methodologies and their potential impacts on uh, biodiversity in the Arctic. So, as Emma said, my name is Tom. I work with the Arctic Council and uh, specifically with the conservation of Arctic flora and fauna, which is the biodiversity work of the council. And Susie, if you could change the slide for me, please. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I've been at home sick for the last week or so, so I'm a bit hoarse. <laughs> but uh, I'm also a geographer, and I always like to start every presentation with a map. And uh, this map that's on the screen here, that red border shows the operational boundary within which CAF conducts its activities. Now, it's a huge area. Almost 60% of it is marine, so it's very relevant for, for the discussions that we're having in this seminar. And one of the biggest challenges that we face in the Arctic Council and, and elsewhere, of course, is in such a huge area, how do we shorten the time between when we detect issues that are happening that are of concern for biodiversity and ecosystems in the Arctic, and we somehow develop recommendations or options for appropriate responses. So the challenge that we face in this area within CAF is how do we shorten the time between detecting trends or issues occurring with biodiversity and how do we then shorten the time between when we're able to deliver to Arctic states and indigenous organizations and other stakeholders relevant recommendations, advice or options for how they might respond in a sustainable way to whatever the issue might be. So within this broad area, what CAF does is we monitor what's happening to Arctic biodiversity. We conduct assessments on the outcomes or the findings from our monitoring activities. And from our assessments, we develop a whole, a whole range of key findings, advice, recommendations for policy that we then deliver within the Arctic Council structure so that we can try and help inform 
uh, improved or better decision making that will help try and ensure more sustainable conservation and management of the Arctic and its environment and ecosystems. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one area that CAF has been working on quite extensively over the last few years as well, which is very relevant for our discussions here, is that uh, there's been an increasing focus on the issue of mainstreaming and how do we ensure that development activities in the Arctic take uh, biodiversity in activities into account in all their activities. Now, we're speaking today about the oil and gas uh, sector, or the oil sector specifically, uh, and we haven't really worked with that sector that much within the context of biodiversity, but we have worked extensively over the last few years with the mining sector, and there may be lessons learned from our work with that particular sector that might be applicable here also, and that's something that might be of relevance for future discussions. Uh, Susan, please. So, <coughs> Susan, the, the, the activity that's perhaps most relevant to mention today within the Arctic Council is its Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program. And this is an Arctic wide monitoring program that's comprised of four components. We have a freshwater, terrestrial groups, we have marine and coastal monitoring groups. And behind each of these monitoring groups, uh, we have a monitoring plan for how we should harmonize, improve, or better coordinate our monitoring activities across the Arctic, with the end goal being to figure out how we can ensure that we deliver uh, more usable information in a format and in a timely manner that can inform decision making. <coughs> Excuse me, I keep thinking I'm going to cough. <laughs> but uh, so what we've done across these monitoring plans, these monitoring plans essentially represent agreements across the Arctic states and the permanent or the indigenous organizations in the context of the Arctic Council and how we should improve our monitoring and coordination when it comes to ecosystem and biodiversity issues in the Arctic. And what we've done is we've identified what we call key focal ecosystem components of each ecosystem. So that if a change occurs in any one of these focal ecosystem components, it potentially indicates a greater overall change or trend happening at something that we need to pay attention to. And uh, an example of the type of information that we generate from this type of work is in 2017, the image on the screen there, we present, we delivered what was not the first integrated report on FECs, or focal ecosystem components for the Arctic marine environment. And there we have a whole network of uh, expert groups looking at seabirds, marine mammals, fish, biota, and so on. And they looked at synthesizing and collecting all the information that they possibly could that dealt with these key ecosystem components and from that generating a whole range of advice for monitoring key findings and recommendations that hopefully will inform how the arctic states address biodiversity issues when it comes to uh, uh, to the marine ecosystem and, and all of this of course is very relevant when you start to think about shipping and oil and the oil sector in the arctic because uh, any potential uh, incidents that might occur have a, a, an immediate impact on, on marine biodiversity, which are often very sensitive to these things. And it means that we need to have in place an effective program or format or network that we can quickly understand and monitor the changes that are occurring in response to these impacts. And we can try and help plan more sustainably and more long term to manage these more effectively. Uh, please, Susan. <coughs> And one of the, uh, a further key challenge that we face, uh, in addition to shortening the time between detection and response, is how do we communicate the outcomes of all this monitoring and assessment work? How do we make sure that the options and the recommendations that we have for decision makers actually reach those who are in a position to make a decision or to make uh, decisions that have an impact on the issue at hand? And uh, this really graphic on the screen in front of you is just one example of how we've tried to do that with the marine ecosystem. And in this case, specifically looking at status and trends in marine mammals. So each segment in this really graphic represents a specific, what we call Arctic marine area that we use to report status and trends of the Arctic ecosystem on. And each concentric circle represents a different key focal ecosystem component from belugas, different types of seals, all the way up to polar bears. And when you look at something like this, you can visually very quickly grasp, okay, where we know information, where we don't, where there are strange trends, where we need to focus our resources. And as you can see from this particular graphic, there's an awful lot that we don't know. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that that information isn't out there, it just means that we haven't been effective in actually securing it. 
And one of those areas that there has come up repeatedly in, uh, as an area where we should try to engage and secure more information is from industry. So shipping, oil and gas, all of these sectors conduct a whole range of science and monitoring activities in the Arctic. But by and large, that type of information is divorced from uh, the Arctic Council process or the state processes where the information should feed into our decision making and development of recommendations and advice. So this type of a graphic helps to convey very quickly, you know, where there are areas of urgency and concern. And it's just one example of the type of outputs that come from our monitoring work. <coughs> Suzette, please. <coughs> And uh, uh, of course, there are a whole range of other CAF activities that would be of relevance, but I think in the context of our discussions today and from what I've heard in the uh, presentation so far, uh, how we monitor and how we convey the information that we derive from that monitoring are perhaps at the top of the list when it comes to areas that might be of interest to people on this particular call. And uh, uh, Before I hand off to my colleague Suze, who will go into a little bit more detail than I have, I'd like to finish on yes, another map. And this particular one uh, shows the outcomes of two different processes. Those areas in blue are areas to, that the United Nations have uh, designated as areas that are significant for some ecological regions, and they cover huge areas. And all the areas in green are uh, the results of another process conducted by the Arctic Council, where they've tried to identify all those areas in the Arctic that were sensitive to shipping. And as you can see, almost two thirds of the Arctic marine areas are covered in one form or another for these particular areas. And that represents a particular challenge in and of itself. How do we deal with that? How, how, how do we make this a useful management tool? And it just shows you that the Arctic is extremely sensitive to these things. And uh, having these type of discussions are, are a good place to start to try and figure out how we can address these things collectively. And I promised my colleague Susie to stop talking quickly so she can go into more detail. So Susie, I'll leave it to you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I don't know if I can, when I'm sharing screen, can put on my own camera. I guess you, maybe I, I just have to stop share actually to put on my own camera. Well, I'm I can sorry, pretend I'm... to speak and to think it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am and I will just share my screen again. Sorry about this. Um, here it is. <coughs> So yes, thank you, Tom. And now that Tom has passed uh, the word on to me, I will try to present how we more directly come from the CAP knowledge on biodiversity and how that informs us on presence of organisms in space and time and how this is relevant for oil spill response. The main purpose of combating of, of an oil spill, as we already have heard earlier today, is when health and safety of personnel has been taken care of, is to minimize environmental effects. Um, the environmental effects are highly dependent on oil type, uh, also if it may be short or long term, but it may lead to toxic effect on marine organisms exposed to the oil compounds in the water column and in the seabed. If, for example, important feed items are harmed, such as planktonic organisms, this may also have an indirect effect on organisms higher in the food web. But also oil smothering effects and lingering of the oil in, for example, the tidal zone may lead to effects on organisms linked to this environment. Except from the obvious disruption of, on seabirds from heavy smothering, oil on the sea surface also in smaller amounts may disrupt the further structure and hence lead to loss of insulation capacity, which may cause the birds to freeze to death. So for combat of oil spills in especially remote areas, several oil spill response te techniques are actually available. In most countries, mechanical recovery is the default method, which we also have seen an example of today. Uh, but also using chemical dispersants and or in situ burning may be relevant considering potential harsh weather conditions such as stormy weather or cover of sea ice. However, one thing is to consider if it is operational possible. So that is a can we question, but it is also a bene overall benefit to the environment. And that is a will we question. The reason for this question 
is that there may be side effects to the environment when using these oil spill combat techniques. This slide presents the pros and cons of the oil spill response methods from an environmental perspective and which need to be assessed for answering the question, will we? If it is not possible to respond to an oil spill, for example, due to weather conditions, the degradation of the oil in the environment will depend on natural biotic and abiotic processes, which again depend on specific site conditions and of course also the oil type. Hence, the extent of oil pollution may vary much depending on these factors, as well as the potential beaching of the oil. Mechanical recovery physically removes the oil from the environment. However, the efficiency of the method is very weather dependent and labor demanding and may lead to handling of large volumes of water to oil emulsion, which also have been presented today. But the oil can also be dispersed into the water column by chemical dispersion. The chemical dispersion breaks up the surface sheens and encourage smaller droplet sizes for natural degradation. By this method, the oil is removed from the sea surface, but higher and toxic concentrations may occur in the water column until diluted. The last included response method is in situ burning. By this method, the oil is collected at the sea surface, contained within fire resistant booms and burned at site on the sea surface. Thus, oil is combusted and removed from the sea surface. However, although the oil amount may be greatly reduced, residues from the burn may be left on the sea surface and eventually sink if not recovered. Also, the smoke of the burn may lead to potential dep deposition of such. As the different response methods may lead to side effects in another environmental compartment, for example, in the water column. Uh, somebody should turn off the microphone. Please. Sorry, somebody has their mic turned on. Could you please turn it off? Thank you. Okay, I'll just continue then. As the different response methods may lead to side effects in another environment compartment, for example, in the water column or seabed, hence in the acute situation, potential presence of sensitive organisms in the different habitats are basic knowledge, as well as the sensitivity to the oil itself and the treated oil, such as the chemical dispersed oil or burn residues. The presently most adopted concept is the so-called SIMA, the Spill Impact Mitigation Assessment, SIMA also called, which may also include socio-economic and cultural impact considerations. Therefore, it is important to have knowledge on potential presence of organisms in space and time. For Greenland, and I would think that this has also have been developed for most other countries as well, an oil spill sensitivity atlas has been developed for almost around Greenland. The atlas for the Greenland East Coast is being prepared right now. For the coastline and offshore areas, presence of organisms sensitive to oil spill have been indicated by icons and based on the presence together with other categories, such as, for example, archeological sites and recreational use, the relative oil spill sensitivity has been assessed. For the offshore areas, the oil spill sensitivity has been assessed for the four seasons. Information on presence of organisms in space and time are also basic information that goes into another analytic assessment tool, and that is the Environment and Oil Spill Response EOS tool. EOS was developed based on offshore Western Greenland and the Baltic Sea to assist in selection of oil spill response options that best mitigate the consequences of spilled oil in polar and subpolar aquatic ecosystem in the Nordic region. So this is a planning tool and it is based on an Excel sheet um, and interactive tool and is available on the internet for free. The EOS anal analysis involves several steps. It includes compilation of basic data and information from the assessment area and oil spill fate from oil spill modeling scenarios and where input of presence of organisms, as you see here, which is one of the first steps, is basic data. Based on this first step where the data are compiled, the following steps include assessments uh, and calculations leading to an effect index 
of the different oil spill response methods, scores of recovery time and recruitment, and the SOT pollution index, which is shown as an example here. Also, these indices and scores are used for screening the decision trees, which are developed for each oil spill response method and should be repeated for each season. The decision tree presented here is for chemical dispersion. The results of the analysis are hence based on the predicted consequences, balance between environmental pros and cons of the concerned combat method in a defined assessment area based on potential present presence of organisms in the different environmental compartments. And maybe I should just mention that the tool is followed by a handbook. So if we go back to the information on presence of organisms that calf through the CBMP collect, we here have an example from the coastal group. So I don't expect you to read it all, but this is just to illustrate that the CBMP coastal includes monitoring of these effects, the focal ecosystem components that Tom also introduced to you, their diversity and also potential seasonal presence, for example, as migration timing. So this is all important knowledge for oil spill response assessment. Further, in the CBMP coastal group to manage the diversity also within coastal types and the organisms affiliated to the ecosystems created by different shoreline morphology, the group operates with seven coastscapes of which two is presented here, and that is the rocky shore and low gradient eroding shore. For oil spill response, also the shoreline morphology is of importance as we also heard earlier today, with respect to cleaning up after beaching of an oil spill may have occurred. For example, a high energy rocky coast may have a low potential for cleaning efforts as it may have limited access and safe workspace, but may have a relatively high potential for self-cleaning due to wave action. Also, depending on the remoteness, this may highly influence operational decisions made in the acute oil spill response situation. So therefore, the oil spill sensitivity atlas for Greenland also include logistic maps with coast types. The map presented here is mostly from an area with rocky coasts indicated by the red coastline but also coast types, which could be ca categorized as, for example, low eroding coast here as the tailors category is indicated if present as well as other coast types, which are homologous <laughs> to the CBMP defined coastscapes. In this way, knowledge obtained from the operational oil spill response perspective can be of value, for example, to the CBMP coastal group. And right now, this group is actually working on developing a map for the circumpolar distribution of all the coastscapes defined by the CBMP coastal group. So, <laughs> at last, hopefully this presentation has described the effects and side effects from oil spill and oil spill response methods, as well as how relevant activities by uh, CAF linked with relevant organization and how it can provide input to oil spill response planning through monitoring of biodiversity, the presence of organisms in time and space, and vice versa. For example, how oil spill response logistic tools may provide information to the CAF activities. So <laughs> thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you, uh, Suse, uh, for sharing the work of CAF with us today. And, and uh, I have to say, considering the vast region you are working with, you certainly have your work cut out for you. Um, exploring the impacts of oil spills and response activity on biodiversity is a very important one, as is the response time between detecting and effective action. Now, I want to start with Tom. Um, at the risk of sounding like a mother, I have to recommend chamomile tea with bourbon and honey. <laughs> uh, well, it's actually hot whiskey I'm drinking. 
you're you're on the right track definitely um i have a question for you because you talked about the, the monitoring the research and the science yeah. and how to how to sort of uh, move that into policy and action so in your experience what are the main challenges or obstacles um to this sort of science policy progression do you feel that policy is responsive enough to the science and recommendations from the scientific community well, I mean, if I, if I think of the, if I respond just in, in the context of the Arctic Council, is that uh, I, I think that there has been a lot of response to these recommendations and these actions that uh, the science community proposes. But one of the challenges has been that until relatively recently, there hasn't been a framework across the Arctic states to report or to track what those responses were or how effective they might have been. So uh, just a few years ago, the Arctic Council agreed to uh, what's is known as a, its Biodiversity Action Plan. And that, for the first time, meant that the Arctic Council had a, a process whereby you could draw a line from the science findings to a recommendation to a response on the ground, and then maybe conduct an evaluation as to whether that response had an impact or not. So it's a very slow process. And one of the challenges in the Arctic, of course, is that the speed of change is so big that uh, we struggle to keep pace with that. But there is a process in place now and you begin to slowly see how the science can impact. But of course, we need it to impact much, much more. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, I have a question here from the audience. So how does CAP effective and meaningfully engage with the mining and shipping sectors in order to preserve the Arctic flora and fauna? Well, well uh, it, this is actually three questions in one. Okay. So let me let me finish them first, and then we can All take right. them one by yeah. one. So the first one was uh, with the engagement, and then has this cooperation produced guidelines and helped to change <coughs> the practices? And regarding oil spill response techniques, is there any report in the Ar Arctic for the use of in situ burning in real incidents? Okay. Well, I, I'll take a stab at the first two, and then I'll leave the final one to Suze. Okay. <laughs> Um, so CAF hasn't worked that extensively with the shipping industry, but our colleagues in the PAME or Protection of Arctic Marine Environment have. And there, there are a series of best practices and guidelines when it comes to, for example, uh, tourism cruise shipping or uh, pollution from, uh, from ships and the polar code and things like that, where, where the Arctic Council has had an, uh, an influence on how these things have been formed. When it comes to the mining sector, uh, that's a relatively new initiative and just started about two or three years ago. But we have delivered uh, a report outlining potential ways in which the mining sector might engage with the Arctic states and the indigenous groups to try and find a way to mainstream biodiversity. So it hasn't yet produced best practices, but it's on, on that direction where it's identified tasks that could be done in cooperation across the mining sector and the Arctic Council to figure out how, might, how, you know, how that might be addressed. So I can share with Embla those reports after the call and she can maybe circulate them to the, to the group and they can see, uh, see if they're of interest and please feel free to follow up afterwards with any questions to me. By all means. Uh, Susie, do you want to take a crack at the remaining question? Yeah, well, I think I would like to hear it again. Sorry, I didn't get it. <coughs> Regarding oil spill response techniques, is there any report in the Arctic for the use of in situ burning in real incidents? Uh, no, I don't think there is any in um, in real incidents. It was used heavily within the, the um, uh, at the Macondo um, uh, accident in 2010. Um, I think it is more. It's more introduced now, and and and, uh, and also um, uh, trialed. Um, uh, um, there are some uh, oil spill trials. I think that the Norwegian Coast Administration. Um, I don't know if they are still here, but they are. They are doing trials on in situ burning now in Norway. Okay. Thank you. Um... We have a, a time for at least one more. Um, and here's one from the audience again. We talk a lot about marine environment. Is there any specific oil spill methods to be used in oil spills in rivers? Is there a difference? <laughs> That's a very good question, I think. And then it also came up, I think on the last EPPR meeting actually, or the meeting before, um, because there was this oil spill in a, in a river that was presented from Russia. Um, and I think 
it, it, it will be very difficult to use this method unless you are very good at containing uh, the, um, um, the oil if the river has to be really slow, but it would be uh, running really slow. But it would definitely be something that would be worthwhile looking into. Um, I think the dispersants in uh, fresh water is not uh, something that has been developed that much. And I would be a bit careful about that also <laughs> due to, to that you have the oil dispersed into the water and, and, and then you don't have any control of what it will, will impact. Okay, thank you. Uh, one final little one. Um... I thought it was interesting when you spoke of uh, the sort of, there's the impacts of oil spills on ecosystems and then there's the impacts of the response techniques on ecosystems. Um, and it's an interesting question, you know, operational, can we, environmental, will we, you know, just because mm -hmm. you have the means, it doesn't necessarily make it the best choice. Um, you also spoke of chemical dispersion and toxicity concerns. Um, and I thought of, uh, th there's been quite a, a bit of research on long-term effects in general following the Exxon Valdez some 25 mm -hmm. years ago. Yes. How much do we really know uh, about long-term effects, both of oil lingering in the ecosystem and also of the, the dispersant uh, effects? Do we, do we have sufficient information to be uh, able to clearly say, this is good, this is not ideal. What do you feel? I think we're still collecting information because I th definitely research is needed in this area and we also work with it ourselves. There's some information, of course, from the Exxon Valdez um, uh, oil spill where also in situ burning was uh, introduced for the first time. Um, and, and they have been following for, for many years now. Um, so there's some information there. Uh, but also uh, from the, the Macondo accident, um, I think that there has been some catching up on, on for example, also dispersant where it has been seen as far as I know that the, there might be oil that actually is, uh, is um, what is it called? Uh, sedimented mm -hmm. um, else uh, particles that might um, result from uh, the dispersing uh, operations. And that was very special for the, the Macondo accident because you had this subsea injection of dispersion. So it might not be completely comparable if you do a surface mm -hmm. uh, dispersion. So we definitely need research in this. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, I, th I think you're right. I think we do need uh, a great deal more research. So Tom and, and Susie, thank you both very much. I hope you feel better, Tom. And we're going <laughs> to move on to David Pierce. Uh, David, if you could turn on your camera. David is professor at Northumbria University, and he's going to be uh, telling us about restoration of impacted Arctic sites. David, are you ready? I am, yes. Uh, good afternoon. I'm just sharing my screen with you now. Um, I assume everyone can hear me. We can hear you and we can see the slides. Excellent, thank you very much. So um, I want to talk to you today about Advent Island landfill site. Um, I did this work uh, when I was at uh, UNES, the University Centre in Svalbard, which is based in Longyearbyen, and it was funded by the um, Svalbard Milieuven Fund, which is the Environmental Protection Fund designed to provide seed corn money to look at issues that might have a, an environmental impact. So by and large, as a microbiologist, I'm always on the lookout for interesting physical and chemical gradients, because that's where we find the most interesting microorganisms, particularly when they are in what would be classed as an extreme environment. So as part of my work at UNIS, based in Long Yibian, uh, I was often out and about scouting the local environment with student microbiology students, um, trying to understand the Arctic and the Arctic environment, and what was special about the Arctic environment in terms of how microorganisms adapt to it, and modify their environment. And it struck me that um, the landfill site at Abmadalen was quite um, unusual in this respect. For those of you who aren't familiar with Svalbard, uh, it's, it's an archipelago in, in the Arctic. Uh, Long Yibian is shown on the map here in the very spectrum. And the two places I'm going to talk about are East Fjord, which is the large fjord that Long Yibian sits on, and then a side fjord called Advent that comes off it. 
take a photographic uh, view. This is a view looking up Advent Fjord towards Ice Fjord in the horizon. And Longyearbyen is just tucked down on the left hand side around the corner of the mountain in the foreground. So, so what we can see here is that there's lots of meltwater and it's running from the glaciers on the top of Svalbard towards the sea. And whilst this is a terrestrial study, it has very strong implications for the marine environment. And I'll go on to that in some detail in a moment. But I just wanted to give you a visual guide to the type of environment we're talking about. This is a delta region with uh, meltwater in a former glacial valley, and it's feeding Ice Fjord, which is where much of the commercial activity in and around Svalbard takes place. If we take a map and a bird's eye view of Advent Dalen and Ice Fjord, again on the top left hand side you can see the position of Longyearbyen, where most of the population live. And this population generates domestic and commercial waste. And for some time that material has been disposed of at a landfill site uh, to the south in Advent Dalen. And I've surrounded with a green box here, the area of the landfill site, which discharges directly into Advent Fjord and from there into East Fjord. So the material leaching from the landfill site enters the marine ecosystem via the freshwater river and delta um, to the top of this map here. As you'll see from the map as well, there's a significant amount of mining activity in and around Longyearbyen, and there's a string of mines along the side of this fjord. One of the reasons why uh, it was deemed acceptable to create the landfill site in the location that it is. And if we look at a photograph of the landfill site, what you can see here is in the foreground, the actual landfill site, but in the background on the hill, you can see one of the mines. And that, that small cabin is the entrance to the mine. You can see some mine spoilage running down the side of the mountain. And this mine run out, actually runs in through the back of the landfill site, drains through the landfill site and out into the fjord. So you would, ex you would imagine that this area was already highly impacted before it was allocated or earmarked as a landfill site. But the acid mine drainage that emanates from the mine itself may or may not exacerbate the situation. So just looking from here, you can see there's actually considerable volume of material and it's black because it has been burnt. So it's burnt down material. And if we focus in on it, we can have a bit of a better look at what it's comprised of. Um, it's obviously very moist. It contains material that won't burn. It contains burnt material, unburnt material. And importantly, it contains all of the ash from the power plant in Longyearbyen. So it contains a lot of material that could generate organic products, organic hydrocarbons that are then available for leaching into the environment. But from a positive perspective, if you look down, you can see that the grass is growing within this. So it's not, it doesn't appear to be significantly toxic at first analysis. The fence is there largely to keep any blown items of litter from moving around the island. And it's also there to stop wildlife getting in and getting active. If we come back a bit from the landfill site, you can see there is a dam and a drainage channel that leads directly out from the landfill site. If we look closely at this drainage channel, there is clear indication of chemical deposition into the environment. And we can also see luxuriant moss and grass growth around it. So there is a, a nutrient deposition into the environment. The reason why I was particularly interested in this site comes from work we've done in the Antarctic, where we looked at terrestrial runoff into the marine environment, and in particular, the addition of growth limiting iron into the marine system, causing phytoplankton growth and the potential for carbon dioxide sequestration in the Southern Ocean. And if we look at this particular example here in the photograph, and this is taken on South Georgia, what we are able to observe is that Aquas waters show a discharge of Fe2, and it's rapidly being oxidized into Fe3. The poor waters discharge straight into a fjord, again, in this case in the Antarctic, um, via streams, groundwater, and subglacial drainage. This reoxidized material produces fresh, amorphous iron hydroxide and microparticles that are the most soluble form of iron 3. This type of Organic material will vary from humic to fulvic-like in the environments, playing a role in its fertilization potential. 
So comparing these two environments, it was clear we might have an issue on Svalbard as well in the addition of these growth limiting nutrients into the marine environment. So the objectives for this project were to determine the level of environmental change that had been induced by landfill soil at the microbial level compared to the surrounding soil. And we did this through a range of standard techniques in microbiology, which included next generation sequencing, microscopy and bacterial culture. This is part of a general approach I would use in any microbiological investigation, which is to take samples from the environment to handle them in a sterile way where we can be sure that we're not contaminating the material. Often we work with analogous material that's not necessarily taken from the environment, but it has characteristics of that environment. We then concentrate, we look at it in a microscope, we can use various staining techniques to describe the type of microbiology we might find there. We could use molecular methods to amplify DNA and RNA, but ultimately our goal is always to culture the microorganisms so that we can study them properly in the laboratory and understand their physiology. And from my perspective, what's important about their physiology in extreme environments. So let's go back to the landfill site again, and this is an aerial view taken from a drone. And what you can see in the center of the photograph is the actual site itself. And there's a small circular pond in the top half of the picture and a series of red circles. These red circles represent sample sites and all of those at the bottom of the photograph, i.e. upstream of the landfill site, are given the letter U for upstream and all those downstream of the landfill site are given the letter D for downstream. And you'll notice here there are two types of downstream sample, the ones on the left and the ones on the right. The ones on the right are within the landfill leachate, the ones on the left go around the outside of the landfill site and act as a control. They're not impacted by the landfill site. And the numbers on here will, will relate to some of the data I'm going to show you later on. I don't want to bombard you with data, I just want to show that the data exists and the variability within that. So if we start by doing a quick site survey and try and understand what are the physical and chemical parameters in the environment, what does it look like and, and what's happening? First and foremost, the samples here are in altitude and order. So we start with U1 being the highest sample furthest away from the landfill site, and we end up with D11, so the furthest downstream. And what we can see is the temperature varies considerably across this site, from as low as two degrees to up to 10 degrees. And that can be very significant for microbial growth. That variation is mirrored in the sediment, and we also see big differences in pH. And the pH can range from just about three to way up till seven. And this really reflects the fact that we're dealing with a site located in a region for acid mine drainage. So the mine is producing material that lowers the pH, and that pH has an effect on the soil that's downstream of it. From a microbiological perspective and from an organic pollution perspective, we can also look at the total percentage organic carbon in the water that leaves the site. And what this shows across the transect again is there's a relatively high volume of carbon-based compounds in solution. So we go all the way from about six to 12% total organic carbon. And this organic carbon can either act as a substrate for microbial growth, so it can actually encourage bacterial growth, or it can enter the system and not get broken down. If we look at where the streams are running downstream of the landfill site, we can see a clear evidence of chemical deposition from the landfill site, not necessarily from the mines that run into it. But we can start to do some chemical analysis. The next table, again, it's very complicated, so I've color coded it. But this is the results of an XRF analysis, which looks at the elemental composition of the various sites along the transect. And all I want you to take away from this is that on the left, we have a list of elements from the periodic table. The red squares are squares that are unusual in some way, so they're off trend. The orange squares are significantly higher downstream relative to upstream. The green squares are significantly lower downstream relative to upstream. So we can see some trends in the came in the in the we can see some trends in the chemical elements in the water around the landfill site. And if we plot this data on a graph, what you can see from these graphs, and again the, the detail is not so important, but what this shows is that there aren't clear trends and it tends to be point specific and that the chemistry changes continuously along the transect. So this is manna from heaven for microbiologists. 
because essentially what it means is there's a huge range of selection pressures for lots of different types of microbes in the environment. It's a great place to find huge levels of microbial diversity. So what can we summarize from our chemical analysis? Well, the composition of the landfill leachate is composed of four main elements. The first is the dissolved organic matter I talked about, which makes up to about 12% of the aquatic composition. And this can include alcohols, carboxylic acids, carbohydrates, material that's easily degraded by microbes. It also consists of the inorganic macro components, and these are things like chlorides, sulfur, ammonia type compounds. It has a composition of heavy metals, it's iron, lead, nickel, copper, and chromium. Presumably many of these derive from the coal that's burnt in the power plant, but also from the mine washings themselves. But interestingly, it also has a certain proportion of xenobiotic compounds. And these include things like antibiotics and other drugs such as polychlorinated glycogenotoxins. So there are material in the landfill leachate that can directly impact microbes. What about that microbiology? Well, this is a technique for looking at the total number of bacteria in a sample, and it involves staining cells with a compound called DAPI. And DAPI stains any double stranded DNA. And I've highlighted with a white arrow an example of a bacterial cell in sediment from an aquatic system. And using this method, we can work out exactly how many bacterial cells are in the landfill site transect. We look on the table, if you look on the right hand column here, you can see the DAPI counts per mil, and these range from about 300 to way over 4,000. So there's a tenfold order of magnitude change in the number of cells along the transect. And this is encouraging because it means that bacteria are actually growing in the aquatic environment around the landfill waste. It's not toxic and it's not killing all the microbes. We can also use another technique called fluorescence in situ hybridization. And what this does, again, I've put an arrow in to show you an example of a positive cell. We can actually look for taxonomic or functional specific genes within the bacteria. And we can look for things like sulfur oxidizing, sulfur oxidizing genes or sulfur reducing genes and nitrogen cycling genes. We can also use metabolic stains that show us whether cells are live or dead. And this um, image shows a CTC, which is a tetrazoleum based compound, which light, gives off white light when the cell is actively metabolizing. So we can actually look at the cells and ask the question, are they alive or dead? And yes, apparently they are living, so it's not a toxic environment. We can then start to barcode or classify the microbiology community within the different parts of the landfill. And in this um, image here, SS stands for sample site, and it goes from one to nine. And on the left hand side, you see SS one to six, and on the right is SS seven to nine. And the interesting thing about this particular plot is if you arrange them by upstream and downstream, you see that upstream we have a very diverse community, and each sample site represents a completely different community structure. Downstream of the site, however, they're tightly clustered in a very small unit. And this shows or suggests that there's a very strong selection pressure from a particular community that's either very well able to grow in the landfill leachate or it's able to survive in the toxic environment that's been induced by one of the chemical elements that are present there. So, what did this observation tell us about the site as a whole? Well, the landfill site biology and chemistry did differ significantly from the science surrounding area in Avondale and indeed across Svalbard as a whole. This suggests that the landfill site is having a significant impact on the environment on Svalbard, both terrestrial and marine. If we look at the inorganic chemistry, we saw significant increases in key groups of elements downstream of the landfill. And this suggests that the landfill is actually leaching potentially toxic compounds into the environment. In terms of organic chemistry, we saw that the variation in total organic carbon, the observation of biofilms, and also the DAPI counts that we did, suggested active growth in the ecosystem, and therefore this toxicity wasn't critical. It also suggests that microbial growth is actually occurring in the environment, and that bioremediation is a possibility. In terms of the biodiversity, there's a very high biodiversity upstream, but a low diversity downstream. And this selects for key groups that can grow in landfill leachate. 
exclusion of the high diversity that we see upstream of the landfill site. This suggests that intervention through bioremediation could be effective. We've been able to generate cultures from this work, and we've been able to grow these in bioreactors and look at the effect of different chemicals on their growth rate and their ability to degrade particular organic molecules. And it provides a resource for bioremediation. So as a result of this project, we were able to give the government on Svalbard a number of active intervention options. And these range from intervention with bioremediation, which we showed was likely to enhance environmental recovery. We suggested perhaps a pilot scale study might be needed to incubate the runoff in different chemical media with different bacteria to maximize the biodegradation potential. We started to select an appropriate method of bioremediation for this particular site, which included both bioaugmentation and intrinsic bioremediation. We looked to monitor the long-term process and efficacy of this bioremediation to look at recovery and demonstrate its efficacy. And we also sought to set up a medium scale pilot study to investigate the effects of chemical alteration, for example, the injection of oxygen or the slight change of pH in the ability of the natural community in the environment to do its own biodegradation. And from these suggestions, we were able to develop a management plan for the island that ranged from well, a series of options. The first one being to do nothing and to allow the environment to recover by itself. This incurred the risk of potential damage that may continue or may indeed escalate. The second option was a minor intervention, such as changing local aspects of the environment to favor natural bioremediation. So altering the pH, adding growth limiting nutrients like nitrogen or phosphorus, or slightly injecting oxygen, for example. A medium scale intervention could involve active bioremediation, a program of active bioremediation that took place in situ at the site. We could do a full scale intervention, which involves the removal of the top soil, dedicated sites of full scale industrial bioremediation, probably a little unnecessary in this scenario, but certainly a potential. But ultimately, we need a little bit more further research to determine the likely outcomes and timescales to determine whether it's a cost-effective proposal for them to undertake. This project was undertaken as a result of sponsorship by the Malevin Fund in Svalbard and for those of you who might be interested in reading about it, it's project number 4141 and it's called the resilience and recovery of perturbed Antarctic soils. One of the key challenges with this type of work is as will always be. Environmental remediation is always very difficult to get the basic science funded. And this was a unique and, and, and interesting opportunity to produce a pilot study that could lead to bigger, more ambitious science projects. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, um, David. This was a, an excellent and interesting presentation. I've certainly learned a couple of new things here today. Um, chemical deposition, terrestrial runoff into the marine environment, chemical trends in the water, something is going on, right? Yes, indeed. Um, landfills having a significant impact on the environment, terrestrial and marine. Um, I'm wondering what are the implications should there nothing be done? If, if, if people decide not to do anything, what are the implications long term? And maybe could you start with just a very, very brief explanation for our audience? or for me, really, uh, of what bioremediation really is. Sure. And then we have a, a quite a few questions from, uh, from the audience, so. Okay, so first and foremost, I think the long-term um, diagnosis for this site isn't particularly problematic because it's been closed now. So if you like, it's a historical or legacy site. And now the um, waste from Longyearbyen is being deposited further down the fjord uh, in, a, in a much better managed way. So this is about how the landfill site uh, goes forward and what happens to the material that's already on site. It's also superimposed on, on mine tailings and obviously the mine tailings are, are prevalent all around Svalbard and, and those are probably more significant in terms of the environment than the landfill site is. So I think leaving it alone isn't necessarily going to be a long-term issue for the people who live on Svalbard, but it's a unique opportunity to understand the fate of these chemicals in the environment. And it's just sitting there waiting to be explored. 
Sorry, your second question was... Um, well, just a quick word on bioremediation. What does that entail? Sure. So bioremediation is a, just a technical term for microbiology, essentially bacteria, fungi, breaking down chemicals in the environment. So it's a natural process that happens all the time. Microbes break down organic chemicals everywhere all the time. Um, but when you intervene, or if you want to do something to encourage it, you can encourage those microorganisms. And there are different types of bioremediation. So one thing that you can do is you can warm the environment. It's a bit like a compost heap. If you warm the environment, you encourage the growth rate of the microbes and therefore encourage their degradation rate. Um, you mentioned in terms of oil spills, um, dispersing the oil spill. Well, that can be useful because it increases the surface area of the oil particles for microbes to then degrade more effectively. So these things are happening all the time. It's about how we maximize their efficiency and maximize the rate it can be done. And, and you can also, in, in more um, extreme situations, add new microbes that weren't there in the first place that can degrade things, specific chemicals more effectively. And, and something that's very controversial at the moment, but it's certainly got huge amounts of potential, is genetic modification of organisms for specific biochemical activities. So for example, you could take an organism that happily lives on the landfill site, and you could insert a toluene degradation gene, for example, and you could use that to enhance degradation. But obviously that's politically very sensitive. And if that was to be done as a serious strategy, it's likely to involve removing the soil and treating it off-site and then moving it back afterwards, because the effects of the release of genetically modified organisms into the environment is still highly controversial. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go into some of the audience questions. So a question here is um, about regulation. Are there any regulation laws or policies for the restoration of old and current mining signs? Uh, and is there any policy or guidelines to avoid or laminate the harm to environment for future sites? Use. So um, I think, yes, there are. I'm not familiar with them, um, though colleagues in the mining industry would be. Um, what I would say, though, is that there is a very, it's in this, in, in analogous to the oil production industry as well, there is a, there an argument that this material could leach into the environment anyway through geological activity, and all we're doing as humans is accelerating the process. So you end up with higher concentrations of material at a particular site at a particular time that would have happened naturally. In the same way, oil leaks can happen naturally and you can get oil emerging onto the surface. Mm -hmm. So I think there are regulations, but I'm not, I'm not the person to ask about what they are and what they mean. Okay, fair enough. Um, another question is, what do you think about the zones of sacrifice, ex uh, sacrifice explained by Mark Nuttall and their application to mining? Is it a possibility to limit the environmental impact and confine it to a certain area? Um, would it make it easier for a future restoration? So again, as a microbiologist, <laughs> what looks like an impacted site is actually a very interesting microbiological site because microbial diversity is driven by gradients in physics and chemistry. So where you have a, an environment that's very unique and homogenous, you're likely to have a low diversity in it. The minute you start adding new chemicals or disrupting the soil or introducing growth material like oil, then you get a high diversity being produced. So the idea of having some sort of zoning or protection is a great, is a very good one. And you can use science to inform how you set those zones up. So you can decide what is acceptable in terms of environmental damage, how far you might reasonably expect the plume to go in terms of leaching and marine activity. And what levels of um, accumulation or bioaccumulation of toxins you are prepared to accept in, in animals. I mean, the big remaining question is always going to be, what are those limits? And what are the tipping points beyond which you start to see death and, and, and reproductive incapacity in organisms and, and lasting effects that are irreversible. And I think there's a, there's a real drive now to try and understand not just the concentration of chemicals environment, what their longer term implications might be. And I don't think we have all those answers yet. Okay, uh, I think there might be time for one more. So you told us that you could analyze the microbial, microbial community according to their functional traits. Yes. Since resilience in the environment is usually linked to a diversity of functional traits, have you any results about the effect of the landfill on the functional diversity of the micro microbial community? And thank that's you. A, and, 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 
this this member of the audience thanks you for a really interesting presentation <laughs> so that's a very interesting question and what i would say is if anybody wants to follow up with any questions afterwards please feel free to email me at david.pierce at northumbria.ac.uk i'll be more than happy to extend a conversation about this um, i have done such a study in the marine environment so in the actual seawater off svalbard but they're very costly they're extremely experiment extremely expensive studies and this pilot plug just wasn't big enough to sustain the kind of analysis that would be necessary to look at the resilience and the presence of um, functional genes that may or may not be present over time so it's a very very exciting study i just wasn't able to do it in this particular study due to financial limitations okay well one day um, and thank you david i think that's uh, that's all the time we have for now before we move on to our next speaker um, Asta Margret Ausmundsdottir, adjunct professor at the University of Akureyri, is asking the question, is the biggest oil spill on our planet in the form of plastic pollution? So Asta, are you, are you ready for the floor? Yes, I'm ready. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, I will share my screen then. Here it is. Okay. Yes, uh, I ask this question also to link uh, something uh, to uh, the theme of this um, conference that is uh, about the oil spill. But I want to take uh, another perspective of this problem. I have been working with microplastics for the last few years, and I am really uh, I can almost say shocked about uh, the situation uh, in the uh, oceans regarding the plastic pollution. Uh, well, plastic is actually made of uh, fossil oil, as can be seen on this picture. It's an example of how polystyrene is made. Uh, there is some uh, fraction of the fossil oil that is used for uh, making uh, polymers that uh, with the help of some additives, which can be antioxidants, uh, forming agents, plasticizers, pigments, and uh, other things. And we can produce actually a quite uh, different products from it. And uh, plastic is really a nice material and it's hardly to imagine modern life without plastic because we see it everywhere. But uh, it is also cheap in production and uh, malleable, and it's really, it's really a nice material. But maybe we have to reconsider a little bit how we use it. Plastic production has been growing constantly since uh, then <clears throat> about 1950 when its production started. And we can see, say that uh, annual production of plastic is uh, comparable to uh, two thirds of the weight of the world's population. And it is still growing. And the use of it, uh, as I told you earlier, it is used in different sectors. And this picture shows a little bit how we can, uh, how this is divided. And you can see that packaging is the far uh, most common use of the plastic it's about it's about one third or even more than one third of the plastic that is used for for packaging and that is often uh, just a single use plastic and uh, then if we look at the life cycle of plastic uh, this picture is uh, representing the plastic that has been uh, produced since uh, the very start. And uh, <clears throat> it has been estimated that one third of all the plastic is in use. Uh, it is uh, the building material and some technical uh, parts. And uh, yeah, it's widely used, as I said. Uh, and 70% uh, of the plastic is discarded or more or less just a single use plastic. 
uh, a small fraction is recycled, uh, about uh, seven percent, but the, the most amount is just discarded, and uh, that is where the problem starts, actually. Um, see? Sorry, I have some problems in changing the slide. Let's see. Okay, sorry about this. Uh, well, uh, scientists have estimated that quite a lot of the plastic, some say 10%, uh, ends up in the oceans. And uh, they have estimated that in the oceans we have about 20, 250 million tons of plastic floating. And then they are not counting all the plastic that has uh, sunk uh, to the bottom of the deep seas. Uh, durability of the plastic uh, is uh, long, and we could uh, say that most of the plastic that once finished in the oceans is still there, but it's not, uh, it's not um, staying the same, it is uh, breaking apart, and uh, the microplastics, which is uh, defined as the plastics less than five millimeters in size, is growing uh, very, very uh, rapidly. And the estimates uh, are based also on beach surveys and sample collections. But uh, nature is getting sick, sick of our plastic. It's not only a, an aesthetical, uh, aesthetically detrimental, but it's also a serious threat to ecosystems, to shipping, fishing, and tourism. And uh, plastic, once it is in the sea, can travel the globe. And it is actually a very international problem, like the acidification of the oceans and climate change. And the science of uh, plastic litter or, or plastic pollution in the oceans is actually quite a new field and uh, there are many mysteries here that we uh, the scientists have not uh, understood very well but uh, beaches is uh, one way of monitoring plastic in seas uh, are full of plastic in Iceland 83 percent of uh, litter pieces are plastic and 95 percent of the weight of the uh, litter on beaches is plastic and uh, the Blue Army in Iceland has collected up to one ton uh, of plastic per kilometer of coastline. Uh, here is a map uh, Ericsson uh, et al. Uh, published uh, this study. This is based of sampling, based on sampling, uh, sampling of uh, about two thousand. Uh, Sampling, uh, sampling expeditions, you could say, where uh, litter is collected, and it is here divided by size. And on the pictures above, you can see the pieces of plastic. It is a count per kilometer, uh, which is less than five millimeters, actually less than 4.5 millimeters. That would be uh, the microplastic. And you can see that this is collected in a certain areas. It turns out that the litter trends to collect in the world's, world's five large uh, gyres, that is North and South Pacific gyre, North and South Atlantic gyre, and uh, the Indian Ocean gyre. But uh, you can see that there are some plastics also in the Arctic. You can see that especially on these two upper pictures showing the microplastic. Uh, the, the two lower pictures show uh, bigger size, uh, bigger pieces of plastic that are uh, smaller in number, obviously, 
but uh, not necessarily smaller in weight. But the microplastic that I would like to talk a little bit about is a plastic that has broken down either by environmental factors such as uh, sunlight, uh, warmth and waves, or by uh, hydrolysis or oxidations, either chemical or biological. But the plastic at the end uh, gets uh, to these smaller sizes. Some of it actually enters the sea already on this microplastic uh, state. But the attention of scientists uh, arose only about 10 years ago. And on this slide, you can see the number of uh, reviewed articles. Uh, Austa? Yeah. I'm sorry, this is Embla. Just to let you know that uh, the, your presentation has been stuck on, on, uh, um, on one particular slide for a while now, just so that you know. OK. May uh, I stop sharing your screen and then reshare and see if. Uh, yes, yes. Which slides is it? Can you? Um, it's the one that discusses primary production and then in use stocks, uh, secondary oh. recycled. Yeah. OK. I will, let's hope this is going to, you see the first slide now? I can see the first slide, yes. So it, is it this one? It's this one that it was stuck on. Okay, I will go just really fast through the slides then. Okay. Oh, I have some problems. That's. I don't know. Uh, you know, Asta, we can actually see the slides without you going into slideshow. So okay, yes. Have, okay, let's good. try it like this. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was, uh, yes, I was telling you about uh, the amount of microplastic in the oceans and uh, what it is doing with uh, the life, the, the biota, and also to uh, other activities. And I was also talking about this slide here that shows the distribution of plastic litter around the globe and where it is uh, located uh, according to a survey that was made. Uh, then I was talking about the microplastic, how it is formed by the breakdown of the larger pieces, either by uh, the nature itself, that is light uh, and waves, and also by some biological processes and chemical processes. But uh, then I want to also talk about uh, the effects of the microplastic. Uh, once it is breaking down, it can also absorb uh, some uh, chemicals that are already in the oceans, like some uh, persistent, persistent organic pollutants or, uh, and it can also lead the chemical additives that have been used when making of the plastic. And uh, all this is then consumed by the biota. And uh, there is this um, question, if this is accumulating then in the food web, and not so much is known about this yet. But the effects on biota is, uh, not only, uh, yeah, it is. it can be summarized on this slide here, uh, that plastic is mistaken for food by, by the animals. The alien species can travel on plastic. Alien species can attach to the plastic uh, and then travel with it uh, around the globe. And that can have some negative effects on ecosystems. And also, when we go down uh, in size, uh, below one micron, for example, in the plastic pieces that are really tiny, they have the possibility to enter cells. And they have been found in zooplankton and microalgae. And uh, scientists uh, don't know exactly what effects they could have there. Some research show toxicological effects on microplastics such as uh, reduced growth, reproduction, or death rate, or other biological activities. Uh, and toxic materials, as I mentioned before, 
uh, can also have their effects. I just want to show you <clears throat> some studies very fast that we have been doing in Akureyri, Iceland and the surrounding. And this slide shows uh, the microplastic in the sediments in Eyjafjörður, close to the town of Akureyri. And I want to point uh, out to you the fact that uh, the site number zero here is the outlet of the sewage from the town and it contains a quite a high amount of the microplastic, but the sewage is a known source for microplastic. Uh, and when uh, it is not treated, like is mostly the case, for example, in Iceland, and uh, I don't know the, situ the situation in the Arctic uh, all over, but I suspect that in small communities, a sewage treatment is often not a priority. Uh, we have also measured uh, microplastic in drinking wa water in Akureyri, uh, where uh, the drinking water is taken from underground wells. And fortunately, we found only a really small amount of microplastic. Uh, but we have also uh, taken samples from really remote areas like glaciers in Iceland, Hofsjökull glacier, uh, which is uh, in the middle of the highlands and from a rather remote lake, Höykadalsvatn, and we can see a microplastic there. In the sediment of Höykadalsvatn, we were able to, uh, we were able to uh, go uh, back in time because the sediment is in really uh, uh, clear layers according to years, and we could actually trace uh, the appearance of uh, plastic uh, until a little, little bit before 1950. So there is no doubt anymore, not only because of this, of course, but scientists have been discovering that the microplastic is all over. And uh, if we think about the Arctic Sea and the Arctic Sea ice, uh, scientists recently have uh, discovered quite high amount of microplastic in sea ice in the Arctic and also in the sea below, but uh, in the sea ice, it is 1000 times higher the concentration. So it seems that the sea ice is accumulating the microplastic. Uh, and, um, uh, but we, we scientists don't know exactly how, uh, what, what is the transport route for the microplastic, how, uh, does the mi microplastic enter the Arctic uh, Ocean? Uh, there are indications that it uh, they travel by air, but uh, we have also indications and uh, the, the most, uh, maybe the most important source would be the uh, warm water, Atlantic water and Pacific waters that enter the Arctic through the Bering Strait and uh, through the uh, yeah, through the along the coast of Norway, but uh, the sea ice when it, it goes across the poles, it is the the black arrows that show the, the transpolar ice drift, and uh, where the ice uh, goes towards the Fra Fram Strait, and actually many of the analyses that have been made are made uh, close to the Fram Strait. And I'm talking about analysis showing quite, quite high concentration of microplastic. But the Arctic is changing very rapidly, as you know, of course. And uh, these uh, factors now uh, could change rapidly if the sea uh, ice extends, uh, uh, continues to shrink, and the winds will uh, start to count much more uh, in the movements in the area. But uh, at the end, I just want to point out that uh, in the Arctic, we have quite vulnerable ecosystem that is suffering a dramatic habitat loss, increased temperature acidification, invasion of alien species, and uh, increasing anthropogenic impacts. That uh, uh, some addition like this microplastic uh, pollution that we actually don't know uh, what effects will will have 
And on this picture, you can see where the red uh, names are put in the picture, where actually we know, uh, we have observed uh, that these animals uh, and, uh, or, or, or vegetation have a plastic inside. And the orange names are uh, species that have been observed uh, digesting um, or you're eating plastic under laboratory conditions. But uh, I want to leave you with this question, what can we do? And uh, it can be said that unlike global warming, marine debris should be easy to prevent just by managing better our rapids. But we have already a lot of uh, plastic in the seas. And uh, the question is, how can we clean up the plastic in the oceans? Thank you, and sorry for these problems. I hope uh, I got it now, at least. Yes, that was perfect, Austa. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for a very thought-provoking presentation. Um, it really is truly astounding the quantity of plastics we humans use and the enormous impacts on ecosystems it has. It really never fails to shock me, as is how ingrained it has become in our lives. And it's, it's kind of like we've been in a comatose state regarding marine pollution and, and plastics. Now, it seems to me that this is a concern that requires action from the general consumer, the private sector, policymaking bodies and other relevant stakeholders. But um, what about substitutions? Um, some talk of bioplastics. Uh, in your view, is that a viable solution? And how far have we come in finding substitutions? Is that something that you could maybe speak to for a minute? Yeah, I think uh, many are uh, working on, on this actually now. And uh, there are, of course, substitutions. And uh, in many countries, for example, plastic bags have been banned. But uh, yes, I, I think that would be one way, at least, is to find a substitution or to find plastics that are easily biodegradable. That would, uh, of course, be one of the things that we need to do. But uh, it has to be uh, to be addressed in in many uh, many ways, and of course we have to use plastic. I think we are not going to stop using the plastic, mm -hmm. at least uh, I think uh, to find a substitute for everything we use plastic for is not uh, going to uh, come very soon. Mm -hmm. But we could start to uh, use substitutes slowly, slowly, and probably uh, they will take over at least some of, uh, for example, the packaging part, at least I, I could, could imagine because that is a very short lived uh, or, or has a short, short lifetime actually before it becomes uh, rapid. And that would be of course a great uh, advantage. But uh, my question here is, uh, how are we going to eliminate the plastics from the sea. That's what worries me. And that is what I thought maybe would be a good input in, in, in this conference. Well, that's a very good question. That was kind of going to be uh, my next question. I was wondering if uh, if we reached the point of no return, um, is it possible to reverse the situation effectively? Um, and I think that uh, your question is really to the audience. So let's let's see if the audience has has the answer for us. Um, I have a couple of questions while we're waiting for their solutions. I have a couple of questions from the uh, uh, audience. Um, here is, uh, is the science produced regarding microplastics taken into account to establish regulatory frameworks for plastic production and use? So I think the question has, um, is a question of whether the science is really translating into, into policy. Excuse me, could you repeat the question? Yes. Um, is the science produced regarding microplastics taken into account to establish regulatory framework for plastic production and use? Uh, oh, I'm not sure if I understood exactly what, what this means. I, I think the question is asking whether uh, research and the science community is um, reaching the ears of policymakers so that policymakers are in fact using science to produce 
uh, or develop regulatory frameworks? Well, uh, for the microplastic, uh, I have to say, I'm not so sure, but for the plastic in general, definitely they are reaching the ears of the policymakers. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, uh, states and, uh, are, are, uh, and communities are trying to make actions uh, towards, for example, uh, this uh, plastic waste and also uh, the unnecessary uh, use of plastic. Mm -hmm. I think that's that is what I, you see around at least. Yeah. But how far this this reaches, um, I I don't know exactly. And I I think there are still many parts of the world where, for example, the the waste is not properly properly managed, unfortunately. Yeah. I I I suspect we still have a long way to go. Yes, I'm afraid so, but uh, things are starting to move, I think. And uh, actually, this question of microplastic, at least, is not so old. It's not so many years since uh, scientists actually started to, uh, to examine this uh, invisible part of the problem, mm -hmm. if you can say so. Yeah. And I think it's also an uh, opportunity now to get rid of this litter before it breaks down or before, uh, because when it uh, breaks down to these small pieces, it becomes very difficult to eliminate it. Mm -hmm. That sort of leads us into another question from the audience here, um, uh, which is about microbi microbial solution. Um, such as highlighted by David Pierce for the digestion and this integration of microplastics. Is there any such solution that you know of? Uh, using uh, microbiology for breaking down the plastic, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have to say that I think there is a lot of research going on, but I have to, I'm afraid that I'm not so familiar with uh, the results yet. No. But definitely people are, people are working on that too, but uh, that uh, could be difficult to apply that in nature, I think. Yeah. I, think uh, I think this is definitely um, a topic that is close to people's hearts. Uh, I think we've all been listening to uh, sort of strengthening discourse about plastics in the ocean. Uh, I have one more question for you from the audience, at least one more. Um, Thinking about the many and various Coast Guard operations, could these be used for collecting data? And similarly, other operations such as cruise ships, et cetera, or are these being utilized already? I know it is util utilized. Citizen science have been utilized quite uh, a lot mm -hmm. in this field, because as you said, it is close to people's heart. Nobody wants to see plastic litter around. Mm -hmm. And I know at least some cruise uh, ships have been actually uh, offering uh, cruises where people go and collect litter and, uh, and even um, collect some data about the litter they collect. Mm -hmm. And Coast Guards, I have to say, I, I, definitely they could be used. I don't know exactly how the situation is for that, but uh, uh, yeah, and then, then there are some uh, non-profit organization all over that some of them definitely are collecting data or just cleaning up. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think there is a lot going on, but it's difficult to, um, to, to have overview of the situation, I think. Yeah, uh, it's it's sort of unraveling as we speak. But maybe there's a potential project there between uh, between you guys and and the Icelandic Coast Guard. It sounds yes, it sounds like a project. I, I think so. I think that that could be really interesting. So the last question: uh, Do we know who is the worst at microplastic pollution polluting of the ocean, and can we target them as well as educating the general public? So, so uh, we're very action oriented in the in the in the audience. Yes. Very good question. 
Well, for the microplastic, uh, it seems that in the last years, people have been uh, mapping it practically. They are going around and now in the recent years in the most remote areas to just to see, do I measure some microplastic here? Mm -hmm. Like we have been doing, for example, in the remote, remote areas in Iceland and they have been targeting Antarctic and the Art Arctic and uh, everybody finds something. But uh, there is still a problem about um, standardizing methods. And it's, it is still a problem to, to uh, be able to analyze microplastics uh, yeah, with standardized method that uh, you can compare to something else. Because someone is targeting this size range of microplastic and another one is tar targeting a quite different size range. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to compare it? Normally, people think, uh, or, or what has been observed, is that the, the lower you, you go in the size, the more number you find. So still, we are just there. How much is it? Uh, we, we are still mapping. So it is not so easy to say where are the hotspots, but at least if, for me, what I, I uh, think is interesting is actually this uh, sea ice, uh, this, the, the, how, how, how extremely high concentration of microplastic is in the sea ice. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also think that uh, once it is there, it is quite difficult to eliminate it. Oh, yeah. And uh, while we just see, see the, the plastic litter breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces, it becomes more and more difficult to eliminate it if we are going to do that at all. Okay, well, this is, um, this is sufficiently, um, I think the, these are good sort of last words. Um, I don't think we have time for more, but thank you very much, Austa, for your excellent presentation and and um, making us think again about uh, solutions to plastics in the, in the ocean. Um, we're going to um, conclude this, uh, this, uh, this event uh, with closing remarks from uh, Captain Oven Kristinsson, who is the De Deputy Chief of Operations with the Icelandic Coast Guard. So Oven, are you, are you here? Yes, Please. I'm here. Good. Okay. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Embla. And uh, so, dear colleagues and participants, uh, I got the honor of uh, providing a few final remarks after this great uh, event. And uh, these two days have been extremely interesting and educating. The lectures and the stories about women in maritime are highly important, and uh, they give us fruit for thought and the good advice for our continuous work on creating good working environment for all genders in our maritime sectors. The, today's agenda uh, regarding the environmental issues is uh, also highly important. Luckily, we are not uh, experienced environmental uh, incidents on a frequent basis, so it's important to use every opportunity to share, share experience. In incidents like uh, North Kite, could happen in Iceland or wherever in the Arctic maritime areas, so which underline the importance of sharing experience. It's also very important to get information regarding the platforms and structure or structure of other countries, like we get the got from the Can Canada earlier today, and also about the oil and plastic uh, pollution effects on the in the in environment, which is affecting all of us. And it's extremely important to get hands on this and, and, and to solve it for the future generations. Uh, I want to thank our guest speakers, University of Akureyri, for great cooperation in the planning phase with Rector Eyjólfur Guðmundsson, Gunnar Már Gunnarsson and Otto Thor Wilhelmsson in the forefront. I want to thank Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network, especially our technical management uh, mechanic, Thomas Vigueur, and of course, Embla Eir Dottir, director and, uh, Iceland, of the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network for the planning and moderating today. 
Special thanks for our moderators yesterday as well, Andrew Paul Hill, Assistant Professor of the University of Aquarii, and Niels Einarsson, Director and Stefansson Arctic Institute. And finally, great thanks to my colleagues, Soli, Hekla and Sigros for their ambition and great effort to organize this event in cooperation with University of Aquarii and the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network. I hope you have all enjoyed this event and wish you all the best. Thank you, Aidan. Uh, this concludes our, our, um, our event um, for these couple of days. Uh, I also want to thank uh, our co-organizers, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, um, the University of Akureyri and the Icelandic uh, Coast Guard. Uh, Sole, Hekla, Sigurós, Thomas and Gunnar, if you could show your face so that we can thank you properly. Excellent. Um, I hope you all have a great, uh, great week and great next weekend, and we hope to see you all again in our next event. Thank you very much.